Today's podcast is sponsored by Fire Facilities Incorporated, expert engineers, designers, and manufacturers of steel training towers, burn rooms, and mobile units that are all made in the USA. Welcome back to Three Point Firefighter. Today, my guest is Chief McGee from Incalowit Fire Department. For people that don't know, open up a, a map book or look onto a globe. Akalawit is actually located on the west side of Florida on the Gulf of Mexico. It's very warm here, very balmy. Chief, am I right about that? <laughs> slightly, slightly. Yeah, so Akalawit is actually uh, located in Nunavut, the territory uh, in Canada. Uh, so if you look just above uh, the province of Quebec, uh, uh, the, the territory of Nunavut is just right up above there. So we're in the Arctic. You betcha. Okay. Maybe I was just dreaming about Florida. Yeah. I mean, the temperature is pretty warm out there today. I mean- my, No, it's not. My, minus eight is not a bad day. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. no. It, it, but you know what? It's a great little town. So I got the opportunity to come up here and I jumped on it. I do not regret it. It's so unique here. I mean, uh, th everything, the whole culture is different. And you'd mentioned the first day we met you uh, about culture shock and definitely had that. So- Tell me if I'm wrong. I see this as more of a, a small village on the bay, and you can pretty much drive from one end to another in, like, say, five minutes. Yeah. So, um, well, for your American and Canadian listeners, so it's, <laughs> it's about 10 kilometers or about five miles, roughly, uh, from one end to the next. Right. And, and that is it. Uh, so, at Callaway, uh, is is the name of the capital city of the territory of Nunavut, uh, but it also used to be called Frobisher Bay. Uh, and with this here, uh, we're about eight thousand um, <clears throat> in population, so that is a larger scale city for the territory of Nunavut because most other communities are maybe fifteen hundred or or less uh, of uh, population wise. So. Here's what I'm not understanding, though. Like, so there's uh, in Callaway, and then there's Apex, but Apex is a I mean, is part of the Callaway, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Apex is actually where like the Hudson Bay community or Hudson Bay uh, Trading Company is where they started trading uh, furs with the uh, the Inuit peoples back wow. in like like so I think it was 1604 is when the the Hudson Bay was established here uh, in the Frobisher Bay area. Um, and so that's where they started coming in. Uh, it's just a lot easier for uh, sea to land access because the tide in the Frobisher Bay uh, goes out so far. Like we're talking, uh, the tide is going out almost like, you know, 300 feet. So All right, feet, I can do yeah, that. Yeah, so I got you. Thank got you, you, thank you. Right? Uh, so in the apex side, the tide doesn't really change there. It might be elevation of maybe a foot or two, but not that much. So they can still come right in uh, a little bit closer to the uh, the apex area as opposed to coming right into what is now called the Calloway. So let me ask you this then. All right. So when, you, when we went over there, um, apex, they had the oldest building there, the Hudson Bay, the Hudson Trading Company. That's the trading post you bet. Post. Okay. I saw that. But what I thought was interesting, and you were telling me about it, was their cemetery. Their cemetery is really interesting to see. Can you tell us about, because again, the permafrost, digging here is not that easy. Yeah, so digging here, especially this time of year, huh? uh, it's not going to happen. Right. Uh, they, I, they almost have to blast it because it's, it's more of a, a rock uh, tundra. All right. So in the summer months, uh, like I, I was telling you the other night, uh, uh, they will dig the, the graves and they basically have to project how many people are going to <laughs> sadly pass away. Uh, they would dig so many plots and they would put boxes in there to keep it from sloughing in in the summer months. Uh, but then it preserves, it keeps the hole there for the winter months. And then when somebody does in the community, uh, you know, unfortunately pass, uh, they could put them, take this box out, put the casket uh, into the, the already pre-dug hole and then fill it back in. So... <laughs> Two things come to mind. What if there's more deaths than there are predicted uh, or like coffins dug? Yeah, that I, that I would have to look into. I have no idea. Uh, but I mean, there's there's two different cemeteries. There's one in Apex and there's actually one in the Callaway here it's, it's itself. Uh, so the, some of the locals that are from the Apex area will get buried there. And same with uh, the area here in the Callaway, there's a spot where they can get buried. So there could be, you know, 20 to 30 plots that have been dug down in the apex area and maybe 30 plots in the Akalawa area. Uh, and then it just, you know, 
hopefully we don't we don't well, want to fill them. <laughs> I, figure, I know the, the answer to the second one. So if they dig, say, 20, but only 15 die, they obviously have to go kill five people. Yeah, so you got to fill the holes. You got to fill the holes. <laughs> <laughs> holes don't fill themselves. Now, I noticed at the cemetery, too, and I'll try to post. I got a picture of it. I'll try to post it on my social media. That What are the – that – the, the whale ribs? Those are whale ribs, yeah, in the, in the backside there. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, opening into the uh, the cemetery itself. Uh, again, there's a lot of rich uh, Inuit traditions uh, here in Iqaluit. Uh, they all still speak their traditional language of Inuktitut. Um, and, you know, some of the, the badges the badges and the coins I gave you have the uh, the syllabics writing on it, same as my name tag, right. uh, showing that their traditional language. And we try to uphold that there because they are part of, uh, you know, their uh, beneficiaries or and or uh, indigenous peoples of Canada, the, the Inuit, uh, you know, we want to uphold their their traditions, their language. We don't want them to lose that there. Uh, so it's one thing that we, we, we try to do uh, even just in the fire department, which is having the syllabics there to show that, you know, who we are and what we are, that we're there to help and that they see these here and they, they know that we're the friendly face to help out. Now I noticed too that there there's three languages on everything stop signs everything you're well you don't have the French on there but they they the the Inuktitut you betcha and then English and then French yeah so Inuktitut it, because it's the land of the people here mm -hmm. uh, initially established so that is at the top English is the second spoken language here and then French uh, because there are some French communities uh, in the area as well and we're, we have a close connection to Quebec as well uh, so there's a lot uh, of French speaking people here in town as well so they have all three languages so our stop signs if you take a picture of our stop sign it has the Inuktitut English and then French right and then another thing I took a picture of <coughs> was uh, the bathroom how to choose which bathroom <laughs> I went, and, and I was going into the wrong one and someone said left go left go left so I'll post those pictures too um, so uh, Frobisher Bay right that's the Part of the uh, Arctic Ocean. Correct. So right now, as we're here, it is frozen solid. It is. So uh, basically, when I took you for a drive to where the deep sea port was, mm -hmm. we're probably looking at about uh, probably six miles worth of ice. Uh, so come June, the ice will hopefully have rotted enough. Uh, they'll bring in, uh, the Canadian Coast Guard will bring in an icebreaker, and they'll come in and just do some laps in the harbor and just try to chew that ice up. And hopefully that the tide will start taking those ice chunks out to sea and open the bay because we get a lot of our supplies uh, were resupplied by ships. Mm -hmm. uh, air freight is astronomical up here. Uh, so even most of my uh, supplies for the fire department is all shipped in by boat. Like say, for example, a brand new fire truck, ladder truck. Yes, a brand new ladder <laughs> truck. Yeah. I wish my camera was working because I wanted to see your face when you were there. <coughs> I almost turned red on that one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know where Barnes is going with this one. Uh, so tell us about, I'll tell you what, before we go into the ladder truck, tell us, because this is so amazing, tell, you, tell us how you get the equipment off the boats onto the land from okay, Frobisher so, Bay. So prior to the summer of 2022 coming up, uh, they would bring a boat close in the harbor. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I would be because of the fast tide in and out, the, the ship couldn't come all the way in and dock anywhere. So there was no dock happening. So what they would do is they would have this huge barge and we're talking like 200 foot barge. Uh, they would have it out there and they would load all the equipment on there strategically, of course, so the barge wouldn't tip either way. Right. And they would, they would tug it in by a tugboat as far as they could and they would intentionally beach it. And then when the tide will go down, it would settle to the bottom they would take out ramps and go out with loaders and carry out the sea cans or vehicles or any large equipment that was uh, on the barge. They intentionally beached it intentionally. and waited for that that low tide, boom, and then they pull stuff off. Yeah, out there with loaders and it's like it's fast moving. So as soon as that water has cleared the barge, it's uh, all hands on deck uh, for the companies that are there. And there's you know, loaders, uh, tractors, cranes, everything out there moving equipment and fast. So tell us about the fire truck. So you got a brand new ladder truck and they were delivering it this way. You betcha. So last October they were delivering this here. <coughs> brand new. It was actually at FDIC um, in, uh, I believe, 2019. Mm -hmm. um, KME from Pennsylvania had it there. Uh, 
a very gorgeous truck. Like we're super excited to have it here, like a hundred foot aerial. Uh, so the largest again, hundred foot. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the largest aerial that, that that we have seen here. We have our older aerial uh, was seventy five foot. Uh, so this year gives us the, the extra reach uh, for one of our largest store or buildings that are here that is almost eight stories top, uh, high. Mm -hmm. So we need that extra reach. So this brand new truck from KMU is coming in. They took it off the barge, um, but the ramps were a little bit too short and the, the barge was a little bit too high. So when they took it off, uh, it actually got pinched on the tail end, uh, which uh, resulted in our fuel tank actually rupturing and scraping our um, outriggers. So our outriggers got had some minor damage to it. I think would it still work? Yeah, we can make it work, but it's a brand new fire truck and we shouldn't have br potentially broken equipment here. Right. So uh, it's been sitting parked. Uh, the equipment is on, was on back order. You know, COVID, of course, everything has slowed down production wise. So to get some of this equipment, we had to wait a few months. Uh, all the equipment is now here. And we're going to be having techs coming up shortly. And I'm hoping by mid-June that we're putting that truck in full service. And uh, we get to see that brand new Cherry Fire Engine Red uh, ripping around the town on calls. That's awesome. Now, what I found and I still find interesting here is it's just, okay, so where I'm from, if there's a problem with a fire truck, uh, they get the parts. A couple of days you get the parts. And then, you know, the mechanic will come like a day later after about three or four days truck is up and running you don't have that do you no that luxury is not here so unfortunately they we have a heavy duty mechanic uh that we could take our truck to but they're not uh fire truck specific but they don't deal with emergency vehicles so i mean they can deal with the engines and drivetrain all that good stuff but when it comes time for our, our pump or any maintenance like that um you know they'll try their best but uh eventually we have to call up an uh, evt so an emergency vehicle technician from down south uh, to come up. So uh, last year we had uh, Rocky Mount Phoenix, a company from here in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, they came up here and did all the service testing on all of our vehicles. Uh, they're coming back up to do uh, an overhaul on our engine. And uh, then KME, or, or Safe Tech, sorry, uh, have their um, mechanic coming up to do all the repairs because uh, it's going to be the insurance job of the, uh, the shipping company that... Uh, it, you know, took it off the verge uh, to cover up their cost and those mechanics come up here. But I mean, we're looking at October and now we're sitting here uh, near the end of May. So, you know, it's been almost eight months that I, I've had uh, that fire truck sitting here and we haven't been able to touch it yet. So you're so isolated. It's just not, a, you can't drive somewhere to get something. You got to depend on the boats when they can get in here and the planes when they can get in here. Like today, uh, a couple mini flights were canceled today just because of the wind, yeah. and the weather. So, it's it's so isolated. I think it's it's amazing. You can't just get something like again where I'm from. You just order it. You get it in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. You don't have that luxury. You were telling us about ordering stuff now for next year, and then hoping you have enough. So when because you can't just like oh, I just can't call up and order it. It's it, the the air freight is like I said astronomical. So uh, to order something basic as uh, medical gloves, I gotta foresee how much I'm going to use this year till the, the, the last sea lift for next year so that I have enough to potentially get me through. If I get in a bind, I can call down and order them up, but it's probably going to cost me two, $300 in shipping just to get a few boxes of, of gloves up here. Yeah. It's amazing. So yesterday, me and Jason, uh, my instructing partner, we went into the stores and uh, you weren't lying when you said uh, how much, like say, for example, <coughs> A 12 pack of Coke costs. Yeah, 12 pack of Coke, you're looking at almost $24. Um, wow. Like, a, 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 well, I'm from Canada, I say a flat or a 24 pack. Uh, yeah, you're looking at almost $50, depending on the store you're going to. Wow. Uh, a bag of Lay's potato chips, uh, you know, we're looking at $9. Now, this is all Canadian, of course. Right. So, I mean, what's that, like 50 cents American? No. No. <laughs> no. No, we're, yeah. we're what, 20% <laughs> more? No, we're 20% yeah. less. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, so that's yeah, still, still a ton nine dollars for a bag of chips. Yeah, uh, I mean that's that's crazy. I mean paying paying six dollars for for a chocolate bar. I mean it's great for weight loss, right? Uh, you don't want to eat or drink anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I you know like I had a burger not too long ago here. It was like twenty three dollars. Yeah, it's fantastic. But everything here is so expensive. Just a bottle of water. I mean, 
I, I got a, a candy bar and I want to say it was like four dollars. Yeah. And it wasn't the big candy, it was like a regular size candy. What was bar. your pizza last night? Close to fifty dollars? Yeah, I spent yeah. about fifty dollars on a pizza. That was a big pizza. And it was good though. <laughs> I'm telling you. What was a fifty dollar good? No. <laughs> I don't know if there was any pizza fifty dollar good, but it was damn close. Yeah. But that that's another thing it's it's kind of hard for me to get used to. And um, and another thing is, is limited internet and what you do have is not necessarily the fastest internet. So everybody's got to l- deal with that. I mean, yeah. that's, I've only been without the internet for a couple of days. I'm, I'm going stir crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, up here, like my cell phone, it works on occasion, but where we have some snow blowing last night and high winds, it's getting pixelated or slows down. I mean, trying to watch the hockey game last night, like. I was damn near pulling my hair out because they would get pixelated. I'm like, did they score? I don't know. Is that a skate? What the heck is going on here? Uh, so, you know, it, that, that's that been a bit of a, a shock to me because coming from high-speed internet down south where you send a picture, bam, it's there. Uh, but now I send a picture and I watch the little bar go across my screen for it to finally get sent. So there's days like that there. Um, but it's, it's some of the sacrifices for – uh, the cool experience. Right. Uh, the experience up here is still second to none. Uh, I don't look at prices when I go to the grocery store anymore. I just stopped. If I want it, I'm buying it. I don't right. care. Um, initially, it was like, yeah, like, whoa, that was a complete shock. Like, you know, like I bought a can of beans. Like, there's a regular can of baked bushes, baked beans, and I'm paying almost $6 for it. Yeah. I hot damn. Like, <laughs> the best beans ever. They have to be for that, kind <laughs> for that of much money. So, yeah. <laughs> so if you look up here, am I wrong in saying that pretty much everything here is a rock? There's no trees. There's not really a whole lot of grass. I heard that that like right now it's covered in snow, but there's like moss and stuff like some yeah. flowers and everything. Rock and moss, and there's some like uh, there's some flowers and like some so, some weeds and like thistle that that come up in here. But that's about it. There is no trees. Uh, the winds are too strong and the weather is too cold. That permafrost is just is so deep, you know, so uh, nothing could get rooted here. It would, wouldn't grow uh, to a, you know, a viable yeah. size. Um, also, like everything, all the buildings are built on stilts mm-hmm. because of the permafrost, right? That's Can you explain yeah. that a little bit? Yeah. So, and sometimes like getting a building here could take up to like two years because they'll come, they'll set the ground and then they'll, They'll either blast or dig piles and they'll pound the piles in the ground to that, you know, that hard permafrost. Uh, it could be 10 feet. It could be 20, 30 feet in the ground. So depending. And then so far above the ground, uh, depending on how they want access to their uh, utilidor. So where your, you know, your sewer and your water come into the building. Right. So it's uh, it could take quite the process. And so, yeah, you see stilts or these pilings underneath buildings and it could be like, you know, 30, 40 pilings holding up one building, depending on the, the weight class they're gonna put on them. And then the sewer and everything, it's not <coughs> it's not in the ground, obviously, right? It It's above ground. No, so it's, it's in the ground, but it's, okay. in, it's in vaults. So the the vaults are like heated, are heated right? To keep the, the lines warm. Okay. Uh, so they're not underground per se, but they're underground in a, in a vault. Uh, and so the hydrants the same way? Yeah, so the hydrants. So you've seen the hydrants, and you see the big like the big vaults next top, to them. Or next yeah, to so that's that's where everything is. Uh, but our hydrants here, of course, are dry. All right, there's no wet hydrants here. That'd be a treat if you did. Yeah. You could make that happen. Uh, yeah, so some of them are. You know, the pipes are down there pretty far, right? right? And we got to take a lot of precautions in when we, if we, uh, if we have to tag a hydrant, uh, I have to call my water guy and be like, hey, we tagged this hydrant, and his team will go out there and ensure the proper drainage. Because it could take quite a while for that water to drain because of that permafrost down there, mm-hmm. right? So, like, anywhere else that deals with dry pipes, you know, you put your hand over the the, the, the two and a half inch. You feel right? it sucking You feel in. that suction. You're like, all right, I got her. Well, this one, you could be waiting quite a while for that to happen because of that permafrost. Wow. It's got to be just difficult to do basic firefighting in such a, a I don't want to say brutal, but maybe a difficult environment, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I – I'm freezing every time I walk outside in the wind, but the people that work here, I don't see them really complaining like me. I'm whining quite a bit like, oh, it's so, it's so windy and cold. <laughs> and they're just like going on with their day. Yeah. So how do you do stuff like, uh, when it comes to training? What do you, how do you get them outside training when it's so cold, so windy? Yeah. So depending on, I mean, our, our pump training is basically put on hold. Uh, since the nice, I'm saying nice weather right now or the warm weather. Uh, Which is all, above 20 degrees. <laughs> all, all last week was like, was like three 
minus three, minus five. Mm. And uh, my staff were out almost every day uh, pumping. Right, they're outside, they're dropping the portal tank and they're pumping it into the portal tank and, you know, just uh, suctioning and make sure that they're they're on point. But that was warm enough to get the trucks out there and let's, let's rock and roll. Uh, now, what is that in Fahrenheit? Uh, well, Fahrenheit, so minus three. So you're probably looking at maybe like 30, like oh, 25, okay. 30 Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, but I mean, some of the, the temperatures that we've been fighting fires and or doing, uh, you know, rescue calls. Uh, so like uh, vehicle accidents or medical calls, I, once you hit about that minus 40, we're almost on par with Fahrenheit and Celsius. And uh, last year, uh, one of my coldest days was probably minus 58. And we had to cut a lady out of a, out of a, mm. a vehicle, right? Uh, so even wearing your bunker gear and your gloves, you're feeling that cold. Uh, we had a minus 52 day where we had a structure fire. And, uh, you know, we thought we were using the PPV to push out the smoke in the building. But all we were doing is pushing in cold air and turning it into steam. And so it fogged us out and we're like, why is there so much smoke? But no, it's the steam that's happening. So it's like, shut off the fans. They're not doing us any justice. Right. Uh, so like, little things like that, you're like, you know, it clicks like, why is there so much smoke? But no, it's the steam because we're pushing cold into the hot. Like, like oh man, <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's wild. But uh, the staff here are very re resilient. Uh, you know, we, we try to train her during our summer months. So when it comes to something, you know, as gnarly as a, a structure fire uh, in the winter months, you know, we, we hit it hard, we hit it fast. And there's, you know, we get to try to get the best outcome. Um, since I've been here, we've had, uh, uh, you know, quite a few small little kitchen fires, uh, whatnot, like people burning stuff on their stove, pots over overcooking, whatever. Uh, but we had two uh, good working structure fires uh, that were just kept to the kitchen themselves because uh, we got there fast and just implemented our, our attack very quickly. So where you're located, I can see having driven around, it's 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 not that difficult to get to places uh, unless it's obviously, you know, I'm, icing stuff. I'm three minutes anywhere in town. That's, that's, that's from being at home in bed, fast asleep, to being dressed in my truck and on scene. I could be anywhere in town and it's three to five minutes. So that, it, but you're, you're aggressive pr mostly because I mean, you, you got no choice, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you have to get in there, you have to get it out because of the weather and because, now what about your trucks? Do they, did the pumps freeze or anything here? No, so, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to show you our new uh, ladder truck uh, tomorrow. I'm going to bring it out to the site uh, to, to take some photos and make, you can see it. Oh, nice. But the, uh, uh, the heating component and the insulation in around that pump panel mm -hmm. is is literally like an inch and a half thick. Wow. <clears throat> so yeah, so um, it it's I like to say it's meant to take the weather. I mean, no truck should have to take a minus fifty eight weather. That's just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but the trucks can take it, and as long as we have competent operators out there and competent nozzle men out there. Uh, to know that they have to crack their lines to keep that water flowing, or else we're poached. Yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna freeze up. Um, and even when it comes out there, like uh, catching tagging a hydrant and hooking up to the truck, as soon as we got that water flowing to the engine, that water is warming up the road. Now the our hose is sinking into the ice in the road, and it's gonna freeze into the road. Oh, so a lot of the time now it's like, well, we can't do nothing with hose. Let's get the grater here and blade it off into the side of the road and I got to scratch all that hose and buy new stuff. How often does that happen? Yeah, that, that does happen. Like, yeah. Man. So again, I, I try to project it by having a stockpile here uh, in the station. Uh, so you I, can't, I mean, there's no waiting till it thaws out most no, of the year. No, if it's in the way, then it's like, we'll get a grader and they'll blade it out of the way. If it's, if we can't pull it up, but then we start looking at, you know, the, now we got to take the hose of the service. We got to hose test it to make sure that it's going to, you know, still with withhold that the NFPA standard mm -hmm. uh, so that it can take that pressure and, and still do its job safely for both, you know, my, me and my staff. Wow. I tell you, I should ask you this earlier. Uh, tell me how you got in the fire service and how you ended up here in the Calibut. Oh, wow. So uh, I actually <laughs> wow. jumped in the fire service very, very young age. Uh, I was 18 years old, uh, born and raised on the, the east coast of Canada, uh, a small island called Cape Breton off the coast of Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I joined the Canadian military as a airport rescue firefighter. Uh, so at 18 years old, I went out to boot camp and then I uh, went to fire school. Uh, and that was back in 2001. Uh, and, you know, uh, 
we all know what happens in September 2001. And I was going through my, my boot camp training or my fire school training then. And that, uh, that those events uh, solidified where I wanted to be and, and solidified this here. I mean, we used to call it a brotherhood, uh, but then we've now switched up there into, to a family because we now have a lot of brothers and sisters in the fire service. Uh, so after those events, it solidified me where I want to be, what I want to do uh, so to help people out. So I did the military for uh, just short of uh, 11 years, like literally a couple of days short of 11 years. Mm -hmm. uh, got in the military, became a uh, primary care paramedic and started working in air ambulance in, in way northern Alberta. Uh, did that and uh, in turn joined the uh, volunteer fire department in my community. Now, how uh, old were you when you did that? When you became a uh, paramedic? So, yeah, I was 20, 28, 29. Oh, young pup. Still a young yeah, pup. So yeah, so I became a paramedic and, uh, I, yeah, moved that to a small community. And uh, uh, I was literally on the volunteer department <clears throat> as a training captain because of my experience. Mm -hmm. And after about eight months, uh, the deputy chief that was in charge of running the department at the time was like, man, you got more experience than I do, more training. He's like, here you go. And he threw the epaulets at me. And so I, oh, wow. so I took over as fire chief for the, for our volunteer fire department. And, uh, you know, we went from a, a group of seven to a group of, by the time I left 25, um, which was awesome. And they, they still have, uh, 16 to 18 active members of the department now, wow. uh, which is all I keep in touch with the chief and the deputy chief still. Um, yeah, I left, um, left that area, uh, unfortunately due to a, a marital breakdown. And, uh, As they will happen. Yeah, hey, man, you got to get your and, first wife out of the way, right? Yeah, exactly. Start a wife. Uh, done. That was number two. So, I mean, the second time was not the charm, apparently. Oh, but, oh number two is <laughs> awesome. Number two is awesome. That first one, you just got to get that out of the way. Yes, so, <laughs> I moved down to Edmonton and uh, was primarily teaching uh, uh, at a company that I was a part owner in and uh, just teaching uh, the, the PCP and EMR and all that jazz, the medical training, and doing a lot of traveling. This job for a Callowet popped up and I'm like, huh, seems like a fun adventure. I'll throw my hat in the ring and see what happens. You know, I have the quals, I have the training, uh, let's go. And uh, now was it for the chief or a different position? I was for assistant chief. Assistant chief. Yeah, so assistant chief of training and maintenance. So uh, I jumped all over it uh, because I had the PCP background. Uh, I could teach, you know, all the medical courses. Uh, I teach all my fire certs. So it seemed like a great, great time and I'm like, Let's go check out none of it. Uh, they called me and the chief uh, chief gave me an offer and I was here literally two weeks later, legit two weeks later. So August 9th, I landed in a Callaway. So did you go through culture shock when you got here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, know, you know what? I go through more of a culture shock now when I go back south, especially the first time I got into a vehicle and somebody went over 40 kilometers an hour or 20 miles per hour. Thank you. Yeah, because... Uh, <laughs> Hot damn, I felt like I was in like, you know, a race back car. to the future. And I was like, <laughs> man, are we going 88 here? What's happening? Like I was holding on to the, the, the holy, yeah. The handle. sissy boat, the holy yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was holding on tight because I was like, hot damn. And like, I look and buddy's doing like 30 miles an hour. And I'm like, that's it? I'm like, slow down. <laughs> <It's> slow down. <laughs> You're in double digits. Because up here, like literally in... You know, 10 minutes, I get from one end of town to the next. Right. Right. And it feels like I'm speeding when I'm doing, you know, 30 miles an hour. Right. It's like, <laughs> man, this is wild. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, I've, I've come accustomed to it up here. I uh, very much love the culture. I love the area. love the people. Uh, my staff are second to none. Uh, this group is, is fantastic. Very young staff. I was about uh, to say that when we were doing uh, our class today and everybody's introducing themselves, uh, they were ve very young. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you wouldn't know it. I mean, I guess you'd know by looking at them, but they all seem so polished. Yeah. You know, they're very, very polished. So how do you deal with having such a young, young staff? You know what? Uh, I, I can't chalk it up to me at all. I'm chalking it up a hundred percent to my, my captains and my lieutenants. Uh, Cause those are my, my seasoned veterans. Uh, you know, one of our captains here has been on the department 25 years. One of my firefighters has been here for 28 years and he's a local. He was, he's raised in the, he was born here. Uh, same with uh, my other captain, Saul. He's been on the department for, for 12, 12, 13 years, born here in the Cal born and raised. And uh, Saul, uh, their training is, uh, they train to what we need here in the Cal So there's no training 
that's done that's just for fun it is, is legit job specific and area specific mm -hmm. for what we need here you know because we don't have you know we're not calling for mutual aid we can we i call the airport for mutual aid for two of their they have two arf trucks out there mm -hmm. uh but that's about it but i can't fully disrupt an active runway all right so now, how uh, many firefighters do they have there they, you, you you're you don't you're not part of them totally at all. Totally apart. Yeah. Okay. So they have uh, during the day they have three full time staff. Uh, three of my members work there casually, uh, as as our firefighters, mm -hmm. right? So they have three on three on uh, full time staff, uh, and they have a call at night. So if there's an in flight emergency, they're called at home. They come in, jump in the ARF truck, and then any in flights, uh, they normally call us as well. We have a good. Uh, um, mutual aid working agreement that mm -hmm. you know they have some equipment if i need it i call and i ask for it same thing as if they call for an in-flight emergency they call for us and i do a full page out and we bring all our trucks out just in the event that something bad happens so so do you have to do all the the cross training as far as uh <coughs> learning how to you know all the specific problems with aircraft like the engines no, and all that stuff are you just there for like personnel basically? so yeah so it's in charge of the 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 airport director takes care of it out there he's the uh, he'll be the ic um but he does know that my background is arf uh, so that's always a plus and my guys and all the airport firefighters know who i am they know my background as well but nobody on my staff is trained earth other than the guys that work out or certain guys or gals that work out there um but uh, they work under me when with me or you know, work in the airport capacity when they're at the airport. Uh, so that's it. So we basically were, were there to help out and uh, handle hose uh, and then leave it up to the airport firefighters. But uh, if the airport director asked for more, then uh, I'd be glad more than to jump in and help them out. So that's a good relationship to have. Now, you've mentioned, you know, uh, sister firefighters in Air and I are something very unique about a Callaway Fire Department. Mm -hmm. So to tell me if I'm wrong, the, uh, nat the the Canadian average of females in the fire service around 3%, right? Roughly 3%, yeah. Okay, so now you have a 3 in your percent, but there's it's also followed by, what, a 5? So you got 35% of your percent, yeah. So there's uh, is a 6 so I know it's a seven now. Seven. So seven out of 20 female staff uh, are, are firefighter EMRs. So uh, one of my seasoned firefighters, uh, or she's actually a captain. Uh, she's on vacation right now. That's why you're not meeting her. But uh, uh, she's been on the department for 16 years. Wow. Uh, yeah, very seasoned. And it's why I promoted her to captain because uh, she's on point. She knows what she's doing. And uh, her staff trust her. And I trust her in that rank. So what do you think it is that, gives you such a high percentage are you going out looking for more females or is it just that's how it's working out it's it's how they're working out so when we do the interview process here uh this time i did a full board so i had two captains uh two of my captains with me and an hr representative and we graded everybody and was like okay like who's who's number one who's number two i went down the list i made the list and uh you know just fortunately like uh, these young ladies are a interviewing well and they got the search to back it up and they're coming up here and they're being nothing short of rock stars um i can't say anything to it other than the, you know they're that they're amazing mm -hmm. um you know some of the young ladies that have literally been in the department like a year two years um you know i would i would have my back and i mean you know we're talking you know 150 pound young lady and i'm a plus 300 pound man and I'd go in a fire with them. And I know they had my back in a heartbeat. So, and I, you know, I, I, all my, uh, a lot of respect to that. I love it. I know in the class, uh, we have four females in this class yes. yeah. and they are taking zero shit from me. Oh, I mean, man. uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. The ball busting that happens. Oh my God. It's legit. And yeah. you know what? We can still say ball busting, uh, because <laughs> they throw just as good as the guys, if not better, and they will take nothing from any of them. Even me as a chief, they will light me up in a heartbeat. Yeah, if I, <laughs> I didn't them, notice that. If I give them anything, that's it. They're all over me. So, yeah, there's, I mean, typical fire hall. Nobody's safe at the fire hall kitchen. And yeah. hot damn, you're not going to get it. So, hey, if you're going to spend every day with your crews for a half hour or so to start your day that way, 
you, you're in, you should be in play for those the ball busting. Yeah, some days I got to leave because I'm like I can't. Nature is going to come. <laughs> you know, like, I have to leave, man. I, it's fantastic. Uh, the morale here for such a small base community, for such an isolated community, uh, the morale, the uh, the the family vibe here is is very strong. And uh, I can't wait for the summer so we can build more on it. Uh, start having those family barbecues. Uh, I've yet to meet any of my staff's uh, uh, spouses or kids, and I'm a huge advocate for that. Mm-hmm. I want families involved. I want to know, you know, who their wife, who their husband, and who their kids are, uh, because you know it's not just you and me on the fire ground. It's it's who you're going home to as well. And I want to know their faces. I want to know their names. So we're getting to why I wanted to interview you so bad. So I brought my microphone up here just in case I was going to interview somebody, right? <coughs> I'm very blessed that I get to meet some fantastic firefighters. Uh, but I spent about 10 minutes with you, and I'm like, this this chief is a real chief chief. I'm not saying there's not a lot of good chiefs out there. There is, but I haven't seen a ton of great fire chiefs. Um, and... There's one that, that there's a fire chief in my area, uh, Chief Brandon Skaggs, who I have nothing but respect for because he's a lot like you. If you didn't have the epaulets, the brass, I wouldn't know you're a chief because you you're just you're you're doing what they're doing. Uh, you're supporting them. You're you're leading by example. And we were with you for a little while, me and Jason. And I didn't hear a whole. Here's what I didn't hear from you. Me, me, me. Here's what I heard from you. My my group, my staff, my people you know, this, this, and this, and all the things that you're trying to get them, you bragged on your staff the whole time. I mean, I I didn't learn anything about you as far as Mm -hmm. you, but I learned a lot about your department. And I was really taken aback by that. I'm like, this is a real fire chief. And I've come to find out through the ball busting, they they (laughs) see that way too. And you're in this class, uh, you do training, you, you do everything that they do. There's nothing that they do that you don't do as well. And I think a lot of times I've seen it where chiefs, will separate themselves from their people. Mm-hmm. I'm up here in an office. They, they don't even go to the firehouses to have coffee or whatever. You're always doing that. You you seem to be a very grounded fire chief. And I, I, I tip my hat to you. And I could tell by your, your people here, they think the same thing. Uh, and it seems like a very valuable skill to have here, again, in a kind of a remote, mm-hmm. isolated area. If you're kind of a dick, you know, that's going to make them miserable, right? Yeah. But, that's not the case. So my hat's off to you, man. You really impressed me. Not that impressed me is a big fucking deal. Hell, that's my first wife, right? <laughs> impressed me. You know what that gets you? Fucking nothing. <laughs> that gets you fucking nothing, buddy. Uh, but I love being around people that love the fire service uh, as much as I do. And uh, I, I get to meet those people. And that's definitely you. So, man, hats off to you, brother. Hats off to you. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's... Uh... You know what? Uh, I I come up with with the old school vibe from you know the way you know yourself. You've been in the industry for twenty eight years, uh, so we, we got brought up old school from the the old timers. You know, it was the boys club. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we slowly started seeing the change. But the one thing that I'll take from that is that when they came, when you come from the floor, you don't forget the floor. Right. Right. Where, That's ex- excellent. Like I said earlier today, is that we we weren't we didn't join up as chiefs. We join up as firefighters. We still got to love the job, regardless of how many bars you put on my shoulder or how many trumpets are on my friggin' or bugle, sorry, yeah. or on my or on my, my collar dogs, right? It doesn't matter because it's the members down on the floor that are humping their ass off, pulling that hose that make you look like a rock star. So I'm only as good as my staff are reflecting from me. So if they're going out the doors, they're happy. They're doing a great job of medical calls. We're kicking indoors, friggin' putting out fires, kissing babies, all that good stuff, <laughs> man. And that's that's what matters. And people see it in the community. Uh, you know, when they see, when the people hear about the fire department being happy, it's like, well, why are they happy? Well, sh- why shouldn't we be happy? We're doing the greatest job mm-hmm. ever, most sought after job. And I can tell you that from the the hiring groups that I've done here for the people trying to get just up here in Iqaluit. So I can only imagine what they're getting in major cities down south, like mind blowing. So to to come back and take a step back and join in with training on my guys, yeah, yeah chief's chief, I'm still a firefighter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we we can't we can't disconnect. I mean, you yourself, you're a chief. You can't disconnect from your guys. It's, you're you're always training. You're teaching. You're still doing it, right? So you got to do what your staff are doing. Show them that you know, chief's still human. Right. Or like, we're, yes, we're a politician, you know, like we're, we're, you know, we're sitting up at the, you know, the top of the food chain, but uh, it, it doesn't really matter. 
I you know, jump back to the floor and show them that, you know, we can still do the job. I can still put on my bunker gear. I can still kick a door in and I can still hump hose, right? And I'm not scared to get dirty. So let's go. Let's do I it. I love it. I love it, man. I tell you what, if there was a spot open here for a training person and I saw it, I knew you were chief. There's still no way I'd come up here. Yeah. <laughs> still no way. Daddy likes the beach and not the kind of beach you got. But I would pause for a quick second and go, oh, man, I love that chief. I might think about it. And then naturally I would say, fuck, no. Yeah, that's too cold. It's too cold. Dad, <laughs> Daddy's tropical, man. Daddy's <laughs> tropical. Now, I will say this. So far, I've had really good food, really good uh, uh, local beers and stuff. I, yeah. I, I tickled with that. Um but let me go back on this for a second. I got to brag on you some more. Uh, you did something today um, that it, it I was kind of like, I didn't tear up, but at the same time, I got, I got like goosebumps when you did this. So we're doing our class and you said, uh, in a boo 10 minutes, I'm sorry, that's, that's my best yeah, Canadian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Say, hey, they're coming up. I want to give some, uh, the deputy mayor's coming up. I want to give some of these life-saving awards real quick, right? And that's what exactly what you did. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally, in my experience, never seen a chief um, hand out awards so quickly and make sure they get the politicians involved. Like usually there's like an awards day and all that. And I'm not knocking it, but you're like, no, no, they did this now. I want them to have their award. I want to be recognized. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think really any of us are looking to be recognized, but you did right in the middle of the classroom. You brought in the deputy mayor. You told what happened. And you gave them their pins, and as humble as they were, they took their pins, they got their pictures, and they sat right back down and went to work on the class. I was blown away. I was mm. blown away. I would give anything. Well, maybe I've never done anything that good in my career for a chief to give me something. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I, I thought that, and I did. I got goosebumps. I'm like, man, this is a guy that cares about his people. You could have waited till next week to do it. You could have waited till after class to do it. But you said, no, this is important. I want them to know this is important right now. Yeah, it's important for me to do it, but in front of their peers. Yeah. So okay. I'm not just showing up on a, you know, the regular shift day and going, hey, guys, here's your pins. Thanks mm -hmm. for doing what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen this here as a great opportunity that, you know, we're now in a classroom. You know, I have 15, 16 of their peers in here. Well, let's hit them with it and let's boost up everybody. So it was a time for me to bring everybody's morale up, not just that one shift. Yes, that one shift saved that baby two weeks ago, you know, made me humble and proud. You know, to be like, yeah, my guys did that. That's fantastic. Uh, but also, it's not the only one that's happened. It's happened. I've handed out almost 30 life-saving pins to members. That is amazing. And the right? same group had got I just, I just gave them one literally about two months ago. Wow. Yeah, two months ago. The same same crew. Well, uh, two of the members are from that same crew. I gave life-saving pins. I also gave them the two RCMP, so the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, our mm -hmm. police force here. Uh, two of those members were there, and they started CPR before my guys showed up. So I made sure that those RCMP members got recognized for this as well. So it's, it's not just it's not just for the fire service. Like, I incorporate our brothers and sisters in blue because they need it as well. You know, we look at the stigma when it comes, especially in the PTSD and the, the shit that we deal with day in, day out, mm -hmm. that – you know, this little bit of recognition is that, that the bright sunshine, like, this is why I do this job. Not to get the pins, but I saved a life. Right. Right. And that recognition just puts it back upstairs. That I saved somebody that day. And, you know, and now my peers know it, you know. But uh, Well, you mentioned also how important the, the firefighter's family is to you as well. 100%. Because you recognize that whatever you're dealing with at the firehouse they, they have something at the house to reinforce it or even repel it. Maybe, you know, but you're giving them these awards. Now they're able to go back to their family, even though we don't want, most firefighters don't want, really are looking for awards or almost embarrassed to get them. It is still so nice to show your family, look, I'm, I'm making a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, my the people I work for are giving me these awards because I'm making a difference. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, you said an awards thing. You know what? Like the, the city does, uh, I, I mean, like awards banquet and whatnot. And they hand out, you know, service awards for long time service and all other jazz and, you know, all these other little things. Um, uh, that's great. But I, I like seeing it more just for the staff themselves with their, with their peers. Uh, that's where I like to bring it back to. Uh, I'm not one to get out and flash it in front of the whole city. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they took a picture and they posted it on the city website. Great, fantastic. So the city knows that there are some people still think it's a volunteer fire department here. Mm -hmm. They don't know that we have 20 career staff here, right? <laughs> so uh, 
you know, to get it out there that, you know, we're out there, we're doing, we're doing these things, these things are happening. Uh, and you know, uh, it matters. And, and that's what I want to remind my staff is that, uh, you know, it's, we don't need to have a big banquet to do it, but when I give you these pins, I'm going to make sure that the mayor knows the CAO, the chief administrative officer of the city. So my boss, mm-hmm. she knows, and I'm like, you can send over a representative. It's, it's totally on you guys, 100%. I'd love for you to send somebody over. Uh, the mayor was supposed to come over, but unfortunately he had a, a scheduling conflict. So mm-hmm. that's what they sent over the deputy mayor. Um, and they're getting more and more tuned because uh, I've been asking for it. And I'm like, will you come over and, and help me recognize recognize my staff? And they're like, oh, yeah, of course. So, it's, so it's, I know this isn't part of it for you, mm-hmm. but I can't help the looking from the outside in. So I know you, you, this isn't your main way, but it doesn't hurt for the city people that are paying the fire department to see how often and how important these firefighters are. Yeah. We're not, we're not just a, you know, it's like paying your, your vehicle insurance, right? Like I pay all this insurance and I never use it. Right. But that one time you need it. I mean, this is a full pile. Like we always say that one time you need that insurance, we're there. Right. Right. Yes. We're, we're full time. We're professional ambulance and fire service here uh and we're we're here for the community and we do what we can uh and we're starting to get out there more now that COVID is laxed you know you're going to see us out there more for you know the, the city cleanups crew our crews will be going out uh in a couple of weeks here to help start cleaning up the city we'll take all the trucks out and we'll go start picking up garbage just to help out uh, oh, wow. I, I i want people to see that we're we're community orientated. We're family orientated in the in the station 100. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, I, I pushed the family thing. You know, like guys are like, "Hey, chief, is it okay if I bring my daughter in?" Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Like you know, like I, I it, it floored me when I was asked that. I'm like, "Why am I being asked that?" Yeah, and I'm like, "Yeah, bring her in. Let me know when she's here. I want to come down and meet her." Right? It's it's just it's that that mentality is that. You know, we, we, we got to know everybody's family because it's not just a job. It's not just a job for me anyway. Right. Right. Uh, so I have two kids that live with my ex-wife in Alberta. Uh, but everybody, uh, my kids call everybody from the fire hall like auntie and uncle. Oh, that's nice. Because it's a brotherhood. It's a, it's a sorry, not a brotherhood. It's a family. Right. right? And uh, that was the mentality because the guys would stop by in the fire truck that they went for fuel and just grab my son and pick him up and take him for a ride in the tender. Like, who does that, right? In a right. small town, right? So that we can do those little things. So yeah, the, the family is huge for me, big time. It shows, it absolutely shows. And I really do believe it makes a difference. And I know a lot of times it's easy to get hung up on the technical aspects of leadership, but sometimes leadership is just caring. Mm-hmm. It's honestly just caring. Let's wrap it up. I got one more question for you. Hit me. How in the hell do you become a good chief? <laughs> you know what? Uh, I just try to relate to my guys, sorry, my staff, uh, right. guys and gals. Um, if I can't walk through those doors and make somebody smile or take a ball busting on a chin and friggin' go off to my office you know, laughing or crying because it was priceless, uh, you know, I, I walk through those doors and I, I love my job. I jump in my truck, I love my job. Um, the day that I stop loving my job and coming through those doors, and I don't want to go sit down for coffee, then it's time for me to look at where I should be going next uh, because it's not going to be in a firehouse anymore. I want to make sure that, you know, I told you every day at nine o'clock, I get my, my white girl latte <laughs> <laughs> and I come down my piece of banana bread and I sit with my staff and I'm like, so what's going on? And it doesn't have to be with the trucks or anything. Ask them about, you know, how's life going, you know, uh, and have those chats with them because, uh, as soon as we start disconnecting from then, then we start disconnecting from from how the floor is operating, and we can't do that. Brother, I appreciate your time. You, you've got me motivated, and I truly mean this. You are absolutely, without a doubt, one of the best chiefs I've met in 28 years. I appreciate that. I still would never work for you here in a million years. Brother. Yeah, well, you signed for my green card. I'll come visit you in the States. <laughs> Chief, thank you for brother, being on my show. It.